Yeah, I, I remember Dan when he was just a kid. He had to be in his early 20s, just fresh and vigorous and uh, full of it. Uh, and I watched him uh, mature because he was so prominent as a press spokesman for CSEA, both on state and local issues around here. And he really grew to be a real giant. I was real proud of him and real sorry to see that he died so early and prematurely. Uh, I know his family lost a lot, but so did CSEA and the membership. But he was a real great guy and he kind of typified, I think, the growth of the professional staff of CSEA because uh, uh, there are a lot of them who had similar careers, not such uh, uh, an early loss, but uh, I can think of Joe Reedy, who's still with CSEA. He used to be the union leader at a packing company here in Albany, Tobin Packing Company, that my father was an employee of. And I remember my father calling me up and telling me that uh, Joe had mentioned to him that he'd applied for a job at CSEA. And he said, geez, you'd be doing this company a real big favor if you got him the hell out of here. So I talked to Joe Lochner and he hired him. And our company flourished after that, got real profitable. <laughs> and the union got stronger for having gotten him. So I did two people a favor. My father and my client. You can't do better than that, can you? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> uh, and he still, I talked to him on the phone a few days ago. He still sounds like he's uh, uh, got a lot of vigor and strength less, uh, left. I'm sure he does. Boy, he was hell on wheels out at the packing house and he was equally tough when he uh, came to CSEA. Uh, I've mentioned Joe Lochner, but I've got to mention him again because he was such a tower of strength in the union. He started to work for him uh, when uh, Lehman was governor. Uh, worked all through the 60s I mean the uh, 30s, all the way through the Dewey administration. He used to, he, like myself, when he got old, he talked a lot about what used to uh, prevail and talked a lot about the Dewey people who were among the best and the brightest and most of whom followed, uh, or many of whom followed the governor into the law firm down there that's still very prominent and active, Dewey Ballantyne. Uh, but Joe, uh, Joe went through the period, uh, the transition during the Taylor Law, and he really was a, a tower of strength for the union because he was so dedicated and worked so hard and so loyal to the union. <clears throat> and he was capable, like Campbell, of making the transition from kind of a, a passive uh, organization to one that was a real union. And he was among those with uh, Ted Wenzel who started to see that an affiliation with the AFL-CIO was gonna be a true uh, benefit to the union and its membership, even though there were wounds that were still festering from the bitter contest that had occurred uh, in the pre-Taylor Law days. In many ways, in that connection, just since we've been talking, I've been thinking about it, the Taylor Law really did provide the basis of uh, CSEA joining the AFL-CIO because it put it into the mainstream, gave it the self-confidence to do it. It, mm -hmm. it took more than just uh, uh, a peace agreement among uh, unions that had been fighting uh, literally for their life, uh, it took a real uh, shift in thinking. And uh, it, took, it took both courage and self-sacrifice for the people that brought CSEA into the AFL-CIO. I was real glad to see it happen and uh, uh, it's certainly proven to be a great asset. Uh, real good and uh, Danny Donahue, Joe McDermott, uh, Bill McGowan, Ted Wenzel, 
Uh, I watched him all. I can remember Danny when he was just a rank and file member and a young kid. Uh, he's, he, he really has, uh, he's been the watershed point, I think, for the union's development. Uh, he came from the ranks. Uh, he didn't have a doctorate like Ted Wenzel. Uh, he didn't have an important uh, position at tax and finance like Joe Feely. Uh, he knew the people that were out in the trenches. He worked his way up through the organization, came from outside Albany, which had its own special attributes that are less important now, but in order for the union to get more global or universal, uh, it had to get away from the parochial uh, Albany mentality, and I say that advisedly because I'm an Albanian myself. Uh, it had to, had to know what it was like to be from the metropolitan area or the island or western New York and McGowan and Danny uh, brought it from those opposite ends of the state for sure. And uh, uh, when you watch Danny on TV, uh, you can see that uh, not just the maturation of the man, but the development of the union, that it's uh, got the security that uh, his experience has brought him uh, and that the union's experience has given it. Uh, I'm real proud of it. When I watch Danny on TV, I think he's uh, uh, a, re a representative that all the members and all of those uh, of us that worked for it earlier can say, uh, well, we made a contribution, however small, to uh, producing that figure and that union. And the more I thought about sitting down to talk with you this morning, the more I thought about that. That's no small thing because the, the accomplishments of your era were major. Well, a lot occurred in our era. They're not necessarily things that we produced. We reacted to them. Uh, we were uh, uh, certainly living in the, uh, probably the most tumultuous period of the country's history since uh, World War II, maybe since the Civil War, maybe forever. Uh, violence and uh, uh, revolution where ran from Kent State to Watts to uh, Harlem and uh, uh, the union movement particularly the public employee uh, part of the union movement was developing and uh, evolving at exactly that same time some, in some ways, just coincidentally, because I think the evolution of uh, public employee unions would have continued at almost exactly the same time without the uh, revolution of the 60s. But the coincidence of the two uh, certainly caused the, the uh, intensity to increase. They uh, uh, produced a, a dynamic that uh, made that a very interesting period. But the greatest changes, I, I really believe that the difference between Danny Donahue and his predecessors, which has occurred in the last 10 years, obviously, uh, is uh, more marked than the difference between CSEA in 1965 and 1975. I think I see a, a greater change, the product of what happened in that earlier period, but nonetheless greater quantitatively uh, than in any similar period in the union's history. I think he's, he's, he definitely is indicative of the uh, CSEA of the year 2002, all to its very great benefit, uh, and to the state's benefit, not just the members, the entire state. I think the CSEA ads are good because they portray that. You did a good job, personally, Frank, and uh, I think uh, the public recognizes that. 
in our period that we were, the public was our adversary. Uh, of course, that was the attitude of the 60s. Everybody was everybody else's adversary. We were all fighting. Don't trust anybody. 30, right, yeah. right. That's exactly right. Uh, but right now, I, I think you've uh, gotten to a point where uh, in disputes with the state, whether it's the governor or the state legislature or the state itself as an employer, uh, you find yourself uh, supported by the public as much as the employer does, not in the same cases, uh, because once in a while you're wrong. Uh, but uh, it, it definitely has been a quantum shift, no doubt at all as an observer for the last 30 years. Uh, I, I think I can say affirmatively yeah, I think I, I have to give credit to my wife for one of the best lines of, the, of describing CSCA, the heart of New York. And she came up yeah. with that. And I, that's I super. It. I mean, yeah. that's what CSCA is. There's no doubt about it. Way. And that kind of even fits with the I Love New York slogan uh, real neatly. It shows that there's, uh, that, that there are distinctions but not differences in goals. There's the same goal to... Well, one of the secrets of that campaign is the four notes that sing CSEA at the end of that actually harmonize on purpose with, with I, I Love New York. York. Yeah. Nobody knows that but me. But well, you know. I must have thought of it subliminally. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe subliminal advertising. You get, yeah, well, just with foggy people. It's my trip out to Apple that did it. Well, too. Uh, we've talked yeah. about dealing with the state government. CSEA dealt a lot with local governments. Oh, it certainly you know did. A lot about that yeah, too. yeah. Well, ba even back in the '60s and '70s, they they had uh, sophisticated ad hoc, uh, uh, de facto negotiating arrangements with all the major metropolitan uh, areas: mm -hmm. uh, Nassau County, Westchester County, Suffolk County. Nassau County, for example, uh, with Er Flammenbaum about whom I've spoken before, had a real formalized uh, process for negotiations between CSEA and the, first the representatives of the County Board of Supervisors and then when they inaugurated the County Executive. Real interesting character there, as a matter of fact. They had a very sophisticated uh, uh, negotiating structure. The County Executive back in Flammenbaum's day was a guy by the name of Gene Nickerson who subsequently ran for governor and successfully didn't get the Democratic nomination, but then became a U.S. District Court judge, just died a couple months ago, still on the federal bench. Uh, he just had a hugely famous trial, which has escaped my mind because I didn't watch it carefully, but uh, I saw him on TV a couple times and he'd gotten a little grayer and had a little less hair like we all have, but he looked pretty good. Died a couple months later, that's kind of scary. Uh, but he was an interesting guy and really was was spoken of at one time. He was a Democrat in a county that was largely uh, Republican. Uh, one time he was being touted as a presidential candidate. I'll never forget he came to Albany when he was trying to get the nomination for governor to see Dan O'Connell and went out to the house up in the Helderbergs and uh, uh, with all sorts of press following him and everything. Of course, they were stopped. They weren't a lot, the media wasn't allowed on the O'Connell property. But he goes in and sees Uncle Dan and comes out. And they said, well, what did he say? He said, well, uh, he asked me what I thought the significant of Antietam was in the outcome of the Civil War. And he said, what'd you say? And he said, I knew it was fought. <laughs> That's all I could tell him. He said, well, what did he talk about your uh, uh, request that you support, he support you in your effort to get the Democratic nomination? He said he would never answer it. He just kept saying, what do you think about the Battle of Antietam? <laughs> he said, I don't think that's a good sign. And from Uncle Dan, if he didn't talk to you, I think that wasn't a good sign.
I'm sure it did. I don't know anything about it other than I recall uh, Nickerson making that statement. But Flammenbaum and Nickerson negotiated and uh, kind of the same kind of arrangement that uh, uh, CSEA negotiated with the governors before the Taylor Law. And of course, as I said, after the Taylor Law, the local negotiations were very quickly uh, uh, very similar to the state negotiations. Uh, it was uh, uh, widespread real fast. E in rural areas, the intimacy of all the parties uh, uh, created a, di a different environment so that it really evolved more slowly, but the big metropolitan areas, it came quite quickly. Did CSEA ever have any uh, direct dealings with the O'Connell? Uh, yes. Uh, after the Taylor Law, the social workers in Albany County were organized, and at the time, the county attorney was one of my closest personal friends, a guy by the name of John Klein. They went to the Public Employment Relations Board. They got recognized and designated on the basis of their membership. And uh, they tried to get Klein, who was before we had a county executive. Uh, they tried to get Klein, who really ran the county uh, as county attorney uh, to meet with him. He refused. So they set up a meeting with Klein in my office. I had an office at CSEA headquarters as well as in my law firm. At CSEA, Klein came to the meeting. I still see the guy. He's still around who was the president of the local for the caseworkers in Albany County. I see him in downtown Albany. Uh, we submitted our demands to him. Uh, he said, uh, rejected. And uh, our guy said, well, okay, uh, what's next? And he said, uh, next we go to the ambassador and have a drink. That's the way you union people work, isn't it? And then we get real friendly because you pay for the drinks, and uh, then we come back here, and then I give you a counteroffer. And he said, if you're short of time, I'll give it to you right now. <laughs> and the guy said, I'm short of time, give it to me. So he gave it to him, and he said, okay, that's pretty close. Uh, how about doing this, or this, and this? And he said, that takes a drink. <laughs> yeah. But uh, even old Dan O'Connell and Erastus Corning learned to work with the union movement. They'd been working with it, with it as allies politically, but uh, they, hadn't, they, they hadn't been aware that you were supposed to work with them as uh, collective bargaining uh, partners or adversaries, whatever you call it. But they got it. That's good. Um, let's see what we've, uh, are there any other personalities that we haven't talked about that you have uh, some memories of? Danny and yeah. Uh, Lindsay and I can't think of. Okay, well, we've done the last thing of confidence of the era, I think we've covered. Yeah. Uh, the organization leadership and staffing and how it changed during your tenure. Mm -hmm. Pretty much covered. I that. think we did, yeah. yeah. And all right, let me ask you the, these questions. Uh, what do you personally think is the most important about your time with the union? Well, it, uh, the, the most significant part of my time with the union was uh, what I got out of it. I, I really think that it was an experience that uh, not only taught me a lot, but gave me a lot of satisfaction that I still enjoy to this day, and I enjoyed very greatly over the last couple of days thinking about sitting down and talking to you. It has a lot of real fond memories. And uh, maybe it's a benefit of old age. I don't have anything I can remember about it that I 
feel badly about or regret. It uh, was a terrific experience. I met a lot of good, dedicated people. I learned a lot about uh, how uh, differences between people can be settled by the people themselves, which is a good thing for a lawyer to know. And I think it made me a better person and a better lawyer. My contribution, I don't exaggerate at all. I think it uh, was minuscule compared to what I got from it. And uh, that's why I, when I reflect, uh, when I watch Danny Donahue, for example, on TV, whether he's explaining to the media or in an ad, I get real satisfaction and I'm proud of it. Uh, and I think everybody that works for it has a right to be proud because they're getting a lot more out of it than they're putting in it. And that's whether you're president of the organization or just a member that casts his ballot one way or another and uh, votes for the people that he wants to come down and represent them collectively. As I got to learn about CSCN and my knowledge is minuscule, but I'm learning more and more the more we interview people. Yeah. I see a wonderful organization that developed and grew over time. Sure is. Up to yeah. now. What, what, my, my final question is, in your opinion, what lessons do you think the past of CSEA holds for the future of CSEA? Well, I think, uh, I think there is, there's those who fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to relive it. And uh, uh, the mistakes that were made, uh, the things that were done too slowly, uh, teach, them, uh, teach us all that we ought to uh, be more careful and act more decisively and quickly. I think the people who are leading CSEA can look back at the history of it and say uh, doing things that are right pays off and results in victory. That's an interesting word, victory, and it's interesting in the context of uh, labor union. There aren't many things that you can do within the framework of the law uh, for a large constituency that you can really categorize as victory or defeat. Uh, unionization is one of those things. It's not unique in that respect, but it certainly uh, provides an opportunity to really achieve victories that have tangible, consequential results. Uh, so the people that are here now and their people that follow them can say, well, here's, here's their victories, here's how they got them, and uh, if we conduct ourselves the same way with uh, the spirit of our convictions, doing things that are right, uh, we can be successful and have victory. That's what I'd say that they've learned from what's gone before. Uh, that may be kind of abstract, but uh, I really feel it. Do we leave anything out? Anything else you no. want to say? This is your... I've talked myself out. Okay. I hope there's nothing there that I embarrassed myself or anybody else with. So. Edit it carefully, will you? <laughs>